As production continues to recover to pre-COVID levels, uh, the need for water is once again becoming a priority. Uh, meanwhile, I'm sure we've all become more aware recently of, of the growing issues of seismicity here in the Permian. Uh, here to tell us more is Josh Adler, CEO of the newly rebranded Source Energy. Thank you, Brian, and thanks, everyone. Uh, before we get started, you know, we love to make big announcements at EOC. A few years ago, we had a big announcement, and uh, we're very appreciative to Hart to bring us back to do that again. So as you just heard, uh, many of you may have heard of the company Source Water. How many of you have heard of the company Source Water? See, I can see you. Oh, that's good. That's good. I'd say that's a majority. Well, you're now going to hear a lot about us as Source Energy. Uh, we decided that uh, we were expanding our intelligence technologies in so many ways that we didn't want to keep having the conversation about, well, it's not just water every time we talk to anybody. So we're not leaving water behind, and we're going to be talking about water a lot today. But, uh, it, and you know, I kind of feel like it's, uh, I'll, I'll show you something now, because if any of you have ever gone to one of those magic shows, where the magician does a card trick and brings somebody up and they you know, pick a random card out of the stack and then they pull out the card and they say, look, it's the ace of spades. And audience, look under your chairs. And you look under the chair and, hey, how did they get an ace of spades as a random card under every single chair? Well, look around your necks because it's already on every one of you. Source water is now source energy. So bring it home, walk your dog with it, makes a great anniversary gift, trust me. And uh, remember, uh, Source Energy, the name. And what Source Energy does is we are pioneering energy intelligence with AI, satellites, mobile phone data, and other kinds of big data sources that we put together. What we do is we strive to be the technology leader in energy and water intelligence, uh, geospatial intelligence. So today we're gonna give a quick introduction to the company and what we do. We're gonna talk about Permian water market trends and the interesting things that happened during the uh, COVID period of the last year and a half. We're gonna talk about Permian seismicity trends, which have become a really big deal just in the last six weeks. And so I couldn't give this presentation without going to some depth on seismicity, because it really affects everyone now. Um, and then we're gonna talk about COVID trends in well pad development through SPUD development, uh, detected in satellite imagery. And we're gonna talk about real-time frac crew tracking and what that means for uh, water and energy resources supply and demand. So quickly about Source Energy, we strive to be the technology leader in geospatial energy and water intelligence. We're an MIT spin-out based in Houston since 2014, so we made it this far, we keep showing up, so it must be doing something right. We have 14 granted US patents for geospatial energy intelligence and more than 12 pending. We have some of the top E&P, OFS, and minerals clients. Uh, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, we have all these great clients, but because we give people an edge, when we ask for a recommendation or referral, we get answers like this, and this is a real quote from a case study with one of our clients, leading mineral investor. Quote, we like the edge source energy gives us over our competitors, so we're not out recommending it. With friends like these, I have to come up here and, and toot our own horn, but I hope you take a look for yourselves and see what we're doing. Um, so what we do is we pull together all kinds of different data sources. So when you think about traditional energy intelligence in the lower left there, you're really talking about scraping permits and maybe tracking rigs and sticking them on a map, and that's been going on for about 60 years. We do that, and we do that for oil, gas, water, disposal. We're working on doing it for solar, wind, and carbon. Uh, but we also pull in a lot of other kinds of data, particularly geoscience models around saltwater disposal and seismicity, internet data like scraping legal notices that come out even in advance of any drilling permit filing, and especially around analyzing different kinds of satellite imagery on a near daily basis and analyzing hundreds of millions of cell phone location points on a daily basis to understand the oil field supply chain in near real time. And then we put all that together with artificial intelligence and cloud computing, and what we're able to do is basically understand what's happening on the surface and under it earlier with more accuracy and with more completeness than any other source. And we turn that into a bunch of products. So we have a GIS platform with oil, gas, and water data, Source Energy GIS. We have Source Water Pro, which shows where oil field water, particularly produced water, is coming from and going to on the surface and under it. We have Source Water Geo, which is an advanced geoscience platform specifically for assessing and managing induced seismicity risk. 
We have Dirt Work Alert, which looks at satellite imagery to find lease construction and development even before any drilling permit comes out to predict that early operator activity. And then Frackscape, which is basically real-time frack crew tracking. So now we're going to talk about Permian water market trends, uh, particularly during the COVID period. Uh, and what we saw during that first kind of three to six months, of course, is uh, a huge crash in completions, right? From kind of peak to trough, there was nearly an 85% decline in the number of completions uh, in that second quarter of 2020, according to the EIA. At the same time, we saw about a 31% decline from peak to trough in commercial produced water disposal. So it dropped a lot, not as much as completions, but the really important correlation there is, of course, production dropped quite a bit last year in the Permian. And what we saw was that the amount of produced water going to commercial disposals actually was almost uncorrelated with the change in crude production. What it was very strongly correlated with was the number of completions and the number of fracks. So this is a really important point because this is exactly the, the kind of the classic, the tide goes out and who's wearing a bathing suit. For years, we talked about the saltwater disposal industry as one that can never go down because that water, that water to oil ratio only ever goes up as those wells get older and older. But it turns out that most of the commercial disposal industry is completely dependent on flowback water, not on the regular production water. And the production water, especially from the older wells, is tending to get disposed of or to go into EOR on the operator's own leases where it's produced. So if we took, take a little deeper dive on what the uh, kind of market share composition looks like, you can look at the top, really the top 50 Permian commercial disposers. And of course, everybody lost water during that time period. By the way, we're only looking at the Texas Permian here. We're not looking at New Mexico. And I think the interesting takeaway from this is, first of all, you would have thought that the big would have gotten bigger during a period of consolidation, but that's not actually what happened. None of the large saltwater disposal companies gained any significant market share during the downturn. In fact, we saw more of the market share go to the smallest companies and kind of go to that everyone else. That went from about 70% to about 75%. Um, there was one of the larger companies gained a little bit of significant market share, which was NGL, just a little bit. But basically, all the big guys were flat, and you saw actually more market entrance and more uh, diversification in the market, which was really a big surprise. Now, during the course of, if you looked quarter by quarter on the volumes received for the top seven commercial disposal companies, the top seven never changed, and we saw the top few stay in the same place. The others were kind of jockeying around. If we included operators who report commercial disposal as well, you'd also see Pioneer, Diamondback, and Chevron on this chart, really in those top two or three positions. They dispose of a lot of their own water in their commercial subsidiaries. Um, but there's another way to look at how these companies did during this period as well, which is really in the customer concentration analysis. And just like if you own a a shopping center and you're dependent on you know, one big grocery store versus you got lots of little, little stores and restaurants, it's better to have a more diversified base. And what we saw is when you look at the top four of the commercial disposal companies in the Texas Permian, you see that Pilot had the most diversified customer base. They actually got almost 86% of their water from very small companies. And in fact, they're also, as it happens, the company that gets the most share of their water from truck-based deliveries versus pipeline deliveries, so that shouldn't be any surprise. On the other extreme, NGL is getting more than half of all their water from just one customer, which is BPX, BHP. So, you know, there's, there's pluses and minuses to having a highly concentrated customer base, less to manage, but it can also be less, it gives a lot of leverage to the customer side of the equation. So, as I mentioned earlier, one of the key learnings from the COVID period with water is it really is all about the fracks. The commercial disposal market and obviously the commercial recycling market are very highly dependent on exactly where fracks are happening. And what you're seeing in that video that I'm running right now is where the locations that frack ponds appeared during the course of that 18 month COVID period. Because what we find is that the appearance of a frack pond is very strongly correlated to a completion crew coming and doing a frack within 30 days, which just makes sense. But we also know that the frack itself is the most highly correlated indicator of water going to commercial disposal or recycling. So if you can predict the frack ponds, you can say a lot about where on a very localized basis the opportunities are going to be to be in recycling or disposal. 
Now, I want to take a step back from that for a second to talk about the hot issue of the day, which is induced seismicity. And this isn't a water discussion, um, because there are a number of different causes and possible causes of seismicity, from natural earthquakes to, uh, to uh, subsidence to actual hydraulic fracturing activity. But essentially what we're seeing today is at the Railroad Commission level, basically whether it, right or wrong, saltwater disposal is being blamed for it. So it falls into the water category. And what we saw in the last six weeks was a very dramatic change in Railroad Commission policy that has never happened before, which is on the basis of several 3.5 plus magnitude earthquakes happening in the Midland Odessa area. Some of you may have experienced these. Um, I won't ask for a call of hands on that. The Railroad Commission decided for the first time ever to impose something just a few weeks ago called a seismic response area where they took uh, an area they called Gardendale, uh, which has 76 disposals in it, although only 43 of them are actually active. And they said, whatever your permit says, 20,000 barrels a day, 50,000 barrels a day, you cannot anymore put more than 10,000 barrels a day in your disposal. And we're putting a moratorium on all new disposal permits in this area for at least a year. Then, just two weeks ago, they did this again a second seismic response area in the northern Culberson Reeves area. And you can see on this heat map exactly where those areas are. So those hot spots are where the seismic events are. And then the circles around them, those red circles, are where we've mapped those seismic response areas at different levels. They also have something called a seismic investigation region. So now when any larger earthquakes happen, you know that the Railroad Commission is paying attention. And this doesn't just affect saltwater disposal companies, although it clearly does. It affects all the producers who need to produce oil that has water with it, which is a very high ratio in most of the Permian Basin. It affects the mineral owners, because if you can't produce that oil, then there's no royalties. Uh, and so it affects the recycling companies, because those create opportunities to recycle more water into the frac so that you dispose of less. So how do we find, measure, and reduce that seismic risk? Well, what we do in our system is you can grab any area, let's call, say it's the Gardendale area, immediately identify which disposals are impacted. There were 43 of these here. You can see who owns them. You can then see how much water per day on average is going into all those disposals and see which ones are over or above that 10,000 barrel per day level. And then you can see for each of those disposals where, how much of that water is coming from other places, not just from that own lease. Obviously, if the water is coming from the same lease, then you know it's a lease that's in the impacted area. But the question is, who is being impacted by a reduction in barrels on the disposal in that location? And so what you have to do is trace back the water from the disposals that are affected to the operators and the exact producing lease locations that sent that water, which very often can be outside of that seismic response area or just the, the seismic investigation area. And so our system generates this automatic set of water flow charts that shows for every operator and every lease owned by that operator how much water is going to each and every disposal. And in this case, then, let's grab the most active disposal, which happens to be uh, a Solaris owned disposal in this area. And so you can trace it back and see on these spider charts exactly which producing leases from which operators were sending water to the impacted disposals. And you can see, therefore, uh, are they inside or outside of that seismic response area? And now you can take action, which is on the operator side, figure out where you can reroute that water to some place that's lower risk, maybe outside of that seismic area. Or if you're a disposal company or a recycling company, you want to see that you can run over to that operator and say, hey, I saw you're sending your water right now to a disposal that's been impacted. You should send it to ours because we're right outside that area and we're the closest disposal to you that can take your water without a problem. And so this is a way that you can respond very rapidly to this rapidly changing landscape of seismicity risk. But there's a more important point here because that's really about rapid response to something you weren't anticipating. It's more important to anticipate what's going to happen and plan ahead for that, particularly because under U.S. environmental law, typically a wastewater generator, meaning an operator, has strict liability for any damages caused by water they generated, even if they weren't in control of the water when the damages happened. So it really matters for operators to get ahead of potential seismic risk that's hidden in their supply chain because they're sending water to disposals that they don't own. They might not even know which disposal the trucking company or the pipeline is sending the water to. But we're able to get that on the disposal side and trace it back to where it came from and then look at the seismic risk for the disposals where it's going. So we created a platform called Sourcewater Geo, which puts together 3D maps of over 3,000 fault lines in the Permian, most of them with the fault slip potential calculations, and also shows the true formations and depths of injection 
for each of those disposals and where those intersect or come close to the sensitive parts of those fault lines, uh, along with the volumes and the pressures, so that you can really understand where do we have risk today that we need to take action on before that seismic risk comes up from the Railroad Commission. Now, I'm gonna take about five more minutes and just cover a couple other things in the trends uh, going beyond the water discussion. So I talked about earlier that uh, frack ponds are the best predictor of where completions are gonna go and therefore of water disposal. There's a correlation of almost 80%. But the thing about frack ponds is there actually are no permits for frack ponds except in a few rare cases. So there's no information at the Railroad Commission or anywhere else about where the frack ponds are. Uh, so what we realized we could do is we could see squares of water in the desert from space in satellite imagery. And we built a system that analyzes satellite imagery exactly like this to find those frack ponds, which by the way, turns out to be very useful also for figuring out where you can buy recycled water from because you want to get rid of using that fresh water in your frack or where you can sell recycled water to because they uh, need it and you can avoid disposal in that way. But what you're seeing in this image is not just frack ponds appearing, we're also seeing well pads, lease roads, reserve pits. And what we realized is there's a lot of interesting stuff that happens on the ground in the Permian Basin that either never shows up in regulatory data at all, like frack ponds, lease roads, well pads, or shows up with such a long delay that it's just not that useful by the time you find out, right? Like rig movements and particularly like frack through movements. So um, what we did is we built a system using something called deep learning, a kind of machine learning, to detect all these different things almost every day in satellite imagery within days of it really happening on the ground. And we created a product called Dirt Work Alert that predicts future drilling in advance of drilling permits appearing. And now what you see in terms of the market activity is when we saw the market come back in Q2 of this year, it does exactly what you'd expect it to do, which is it shows a huge growth in the well pad inventory in advance of the drilling permit inventory. So you have to think of well pads as a type of inventory that you need to track, just like you track permits, just like you track PDP wells and ducts. And what we saw specifically analyzing the relationship between well pads and drilling permits and their timing before spuds throughout the last two and a half years in COVID is that about a quarter of the time when a well is drilled, the well pad was built in advance of any drilling permit filing. So it's a significant portion that you're predicting. And this happens quite a lot. Sometimes people don't believe us. Here's an example of some XDO pads that got detected about five days in advance of the very first submission of a drilling permit. We actually saw them getting built about 20 days before when the construction started. And then what we do is you go into the platform because we know, to, to quote someone famous, trust but verify, right? You're not necessarily gonna commit some guys to going out there if you can't see it with your own eyes but the AI is able to alert you to what you probably should be checking out, then you're able to grab any area on the map and run what we call a time machine to see almost day by day what happened on that spot in the satellite imagery going back two years. And so by doing that, you can see for yourself, was this really a well pad? Oh, there's a reserve pit filling up there. Yeah, the rig is definitely on the way if they're filling the reserve pit. Now oh, there's a frack pond filling up there. We make that pop in infrared imagery, and we can also make the cruise pop, as I'm gonna show you in a minute, by using something called synthetic aperture radar that bounces off of the metal cruise on the ground through the clouds. Um, by the way, if you're still using Google Earth to see what's happening on the ground in the oil field, you're gonna be about a year late for every single deal. Google Earth is way out of date. In this particular spot, just coincidence, look at Google Earth, two months later, literally nothing is there, two and a half months after it happened. But there's another really important reason to track well pad development. It's not just about getting ahead of the permits. It's that a permit, a lot of permits never get drilled or they don't get drilled for a long time. We all know that and there's different operator policies. And so when, a permit gets a well pad, it is far more likely that the operator is gonna drill that permit than if you have a permit that doesn't have a well pad. These are very strongly correlated together. And so when you look at permits and pads together, you can make much better predictions about the spending on drilling and about the timing of future cash flows for wells, which is really important for our mineral investor clients. Also, a, a permit that gets a well pad gets drilled much sooner than one that doesn't. It's not just about the probability of getting drilled. And we saw that spread increase a lot during the COVID period. So in other words, the operators were even more selective about which permits they drilled. And so pads became even more important for predicting drilling activity. Also, one more thing. 
the size of the pads predicts the future number of wells that are gonna appear on the pad, which again, kind of makes sense, right? But it turns out that since there's no well pad information in the regulatory data, no one's ever looked at this before. So it gives you a much better idea of the amount of spending on the site and the future production if you're looking at the size of the well pad, not just the number of permits there. Very last thing I'm gonna talk about today is uh, coming back to the all about the fracks question, right? Because let's face it, today completions is not just a water story, right? I mean, historically, we did all this work around tracking completions because essentially all of the water, all of the disposal, all of the propent that gets used in the Permian is used around a frack, not the drilling. But the reality today is that more than twice as much money gets spent on completions as on drilling. Rig tracking just doesn't matter that much anymore. You track a rig, it drills a well, you don't get production, you just get a dry hole, you get a duck. What matters is, did the duck get completed or is the duck going to get completed and turn into a producing well with a frack crew? So what we had to figure out was, can we predict completions? Because more than 90% of new wells now are unconventional. And so we put together a bunch of different factors to be able to do that on an almost real-time basis. First, we know that a pad plus a permit with a rig means there's a duck there, right? Even if it's never been reported. Then we also use something called synthetic aperture radar, a different type of satellite imagery, because it cuts through clouds and it bounces off of metal. And so on the left side, you're seeing a particular pad site that we're tracking getting obscured by clouds again and again, because even in West Texas, it gets overcast just like it is today. But on the other side, you're seeing the crew and the equipment come and go on that pad, even through the cloud cover. Finally, we bring in huge amounts of anonymous aggregated cell phone ping data from a whole bunch of different sources. And what that lets us do is we associate that with the equipment on the pad that we see in the satellite imagery, and it tells us what kind of crew it is, and it also tells us who they work for, because we can see where they go back to, where they park the trucks, and we can see where they were six or 12 months ago and what kind of jobs they were doing. And so we know, are they a rig crew? Are they a frack crew? Sometimes we can see it's a bulldozing crew or a coil tubing crew or an artificial lift crew. In fact, um, we put that all together in a product we call Frackscape, which tracks all of this essentially near real time uh, frack and rig and crew tracking with the crew identities. And then what we're able to take that even further and do, uh, oh, as you mentioned, of course, this is very useful to find the, the crews on, and the completions happening as they're really happening. For the big operators, the biggest interest really is in guarding against frack hits that might kind of get lost in the flow. Um, so they can protect their wells against crews entering their area. But for a lot of companies, it's really about knowing where that supply and demand is or getting it, finding the ducks and seeing where the crews are coming so that you can get ahead of those deals and sell into the completion. Uh, but we're actually able to track the individual trucks. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So we can see that if somebody's visiting a sand mine a couple times in a day, yeah, they're a sand truck driver, right? And we can see where they're bringing the prop in. And in this example, and this was a real example, this was on September 20th of last year, we can see that you know, EOG is in Lee County there, stockpiling sand, which means they're probably getting ready to frack, even though the frack crew hasn't even showed up there yet. And what's really interesting, and we haven't done this yet, but we're working on it, is one of the strongest correlating indicators of future production of a well is the amount of propent used in the well. And so if we can make a good estimate of how much sand has been stockpiled on that site today, we can give you a pretty good idea, since we know the permit, we know the depth, we know the lateral length, of how much that well is gonna produce without waiting the 18 months till the initial production reports come out of the Railroad Commission. Um, and so with that, obviously, we hope to talk to everybody here. There's a lot of benefits to what we're trying to do. We're trying to provide just better intelligence to everybody in the oil and gas industry so that everybody can find more business opportunities and you know, manage their costs better and protect their supply chains in a rapidly changing environment. Um, and with that, I appreciate all your patience and attention. Uh, please come see us right outside. Uh, we've got the Source Energy booth, and remember, Bring it home and give it to your wife. <laughs> Thank you, John.